Nature is beautiful, but it can also be quite terrifying. Although we as humans would like to think that we have control over everything, nothing reminds us of our insignificance as much as nature's utter disregard for that sentiment. That is why nature must be respected. Despite this, it's fairly common for people to visit stuff like national parks and reserves recreationally, willingly placing themselves in situations where nature has the control. Of course, this is because the infrastructure surrounding the park, such as the park rangers and the maps and the trails, make them feel safe. But what if the trail markings couldn't be trusted? What if there was a threat that even park rangers couldn't protect you from? Well, the analog horror series White Stag Education is a collection of five public safety announcements all relating in some way or another to New Jersey's National Reserve, the Pine Barrens. The goal of these videos is to better inform the public about the expected safety risks that come with visiting the pines. However, they also allude to something far more sinister, hiding amongst the trees. Today, we're going to discuss every entry in the series so far, and afterwards I'll try to put together the puzzle pieces to uncover the truth behind the mystery. If you've been on the channel before, welcome back. If not, hello! My name is Minaxa, and in this video we're going to do a deep dive into White Stag education. The first video in the series is titled Pine Barrens Hiking Safety. It begins by introducing us to the White Stag Education logo, and then transitions into a brief section crediting Dan Seville as the tape's creator, in collaboration with Ocean County Parks and Recreation. Then, we get to see the content of the tape itself. Hiking in the New Jersey Pine Barrens can be a wonderful experience, but it is not without its dangers. This tape will teach you the safe method so you can safely traverse the greatest trails on the East Coast. From there, we get introduced to the safe acronym that it describes, starting with S, stick to the trails. It then goes on to give out some pretty standard information about trailblazes, which are markings on trees that dictate the direction you should head on whilst on a trail. A single rectangle dictates the path will remain straightforward, two diagonal rectangles indicate a turn, and etc. The section ends by describing how all trails were federally mandated to be blazed as of 1968, and that you should never venture onto a trail with suspicious markings, or no markings at all, because if you do, you will never return. Moving on to the letter A, Acquire Equipment. The tape offers a checklist of items that you should bring with you. It's all pretty standard. Food and water, boots and other appropriate clothing, first aid, tools like a compass, a hiking knife, and a flashlight. It also makes sure to let you know that you should definitely carry a map with you, which you can procure at any given park visitor center. Now we're on letter F, Fear the Forest. The masked people have lived in the Pine Barrens for hundreds of years. An unholy entity holds dominion over the woods. The Reblations augment its strength. If you hear the whistling, you have stumbled upon a false trail. E. Evacuate. Then, the program thanks the viewer for watching and tells them to stay safe. We're greeted once again by the White Stag logo, and the first video ends. Well, for a video under six minutes, this first entry in the series certainly raises a lot of questions. It seems like whoever we were watching towards the end had not followed the instructions in the safety video and veered off onto what's described as a false trail. On top of that, we get to see these strange beings introduced to us as the Masked People, who seem to be not-so-friendly inhabitants of the Pine Barrens. 
We also learn of a supernatural entity described as unholy, meaning that it's likely to be some sort of demon which maintains control over the forest. The masked people's sacrifices or oblations, as it says, simply make it stronger. I think this first video is a great introduction for an analog horror series. It's a very strong pilot. It does a great job establishing intrigue, even if it hasn't actually done anything particularly ambitious, aside from the fact that there are live action costumes, which I think actually look pretty cool. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next tape, Christmas Eve Candlelight Service. The second tape opens with text accompanied by depictions of biblical figures as statues. The audio is that of a large crowd socializing. The candlelight service is being hosted by the Grandwood Church of the Pines, and the sermon will be presented by Pastor George Robertson and recorded by Dan Seville and Luke Bale. If you remember from before, the previous tape was created by Dan Seville, so we have a recurring character for the first time. It then has a brief display of those given special thanks before the crowd quiets down and the sermon begins. Now, I don't think it actually has any significance to the rest of the story, but the first and last names read vertically do spell out innocent and send help. How fun. At the beginning of the sermon, John 3.16 is read, which is a very popular scripture describing God's sacrifice of his son as a means for eternal life. A bit later, though, the pastor speaks of scriptures from the book of Enoch, which is generally not considered a valid book by the vast majority of Christians. The passage describes the archangel Uriel speaking to Enoch about the fallen angels who have quote-unquote transgressed the commandment of the Most High God. Basically, angels who were thrown out of heaven and then became stuck on earth because they disobeyed God. Once this passage is done being read, we transition to a strange camcorder recording that has no visuals, only audio. We hear two men speaking with each other, making their way down to a basement to encounter an unknown entity making otherworldly noises. One of the men approaches the monster with a firearm and fires a shot into it, but this only seems to make it angry, and then it kind of breaks free from its chains, and, well, I'll let you listen to the rest. Holy shit! Be quiet. This will only take a second. If you're at all familiar with Bible lore, you know that demons were all originally angels in heaven who were eventually cast down by God for aligning themselves with Satan or just doing bad stuff in general. Part of the bad stuff that some angels would do is go down and have children with human women, which was obviously a big no-no. Considering that we were introduced to the concept of an unholy being ruling over the forest, if we try to connect to that with what we just witnessed, it may be possible that the basement of the Grandwood Church of the Pines was harboring some sort of demon. Or, at the very least, it had something to do with a demon. The only group of two characters we know of thus far are Dan and Luke, with Dan being someone we already knew was familiar with the supernatural phenomena happening in the series. Therefore, we can likely assume that they were the two people in the basement, and Dan was probably the one with the gun who managed to get away. Luke, unfortunately, wasn't as lucky. I think it's rather suspicious that a church would be harboring something as insane as a demon or something to do with a demon just casually chained in its basement. 
It's also suspicious that the church would casually read off passages from Enoch, which, as I said earlier, is not generally considered to even be part of the Bible. I wish I could say more about this, but unfortunately the amount of information we have related to this tape is fairly limited. What I'm trying to get at is, all you need to know is, this church is sus as shit. It begins with a warning that the content contained within was not actually produced by White Stag, and it discourages the use of the product described in the tape. Because this message is not seen anywhere else in the series, we can assume that every other video was produced directly by White Stag in some form or another, except for this one. It also means that, despite not being inherently related to White Stag as an organization, it still has relevance narratively. We see that the product is a drug called Intuitine, developed by a company named Genesis Technologies over the past seven years, at least within the context of the original tape. I also think it's funny that a series with obvious biblical references would name an organization Genesis Technologies. How intriguing. It seems like the goal of the drug was to improve the accuracy of human foresight. In other words, allow people to see the future. From here, the tape describes two tests that were run with the drug and then talks about potential side effects. The first test was a trial done on mice, where a piece of cheese was placed at the end of a maze with randomly placed pitfalls. The control group, which was not on the drug, preferred to attempt a linear route to the cheese, which obviously would just result in them falling into the pitfalls. Without the drug, zero of the 25 mice were capable of the advanced forethought required to make the decision to go around the pitfalls. The second group, however, was administered a 50 mg dose of Intuitane, and in this case, 19 out of the 25 mice, or 76% of them, were able to successfully navigate the maze. The results are indisputable. The second test was a human trial. Similar to the previous test, it used 25 in the control group and 25 in the testing group. They were asked to guess whether or not a traffic signal would next turn green, yellow, or red. You would think that this has a 33.3% statistical success rate because it's a 1 in 3 chance. And that's pretty much what happened with the control group. 31.6% of the 250 guesses were correct. The second group, which was provided with a 200 mg dose of Intuitane, guessed 100% correctly. The side effects that come with use of the drug are probably the most interesting aspect of this tape. Those who used the domestic Intuitane pill reported strange, vivid, and lifelike dreams, often leading to paranoia and insomnia. Genesis Technologies identified a handful of these dreams to actually be premonitions of future events. Margaret Pendleton dreamed of a puppet show, featuring four colorful puppets and a park ranger as its main characters. With the way she described it, it felt as if she had seen the show at least a hundred times, despite it not even existing. Henry Ledger dreamed of a meteor flying down from space and crashing near his home in Barnegat Township, New Jersey. With this information, Genesis Technologies was actually able to discover a new comet, and they named it after him, Ledger's Comet. Daniel Carpenter's dream had him standing in front of a group wearing animal masks, standing around a hole in the ground. Daniel recalled the hole emitting lots of heat, and he heard a melody in the dream that he would later transcribe. Merely three days after the dream, Daniel would have an encounter with three of the five entities depicted in the drawing that he made, though the hole he had seen in his dream was strangely absent. And with that, the video ends. When it comes to this particular tape, there's a few things that I want to save for later to talk about. However, I think this melody in particular is very interesting.
If we pay closer attention to the drawing that Daniel provided, we see that there are two owl masks, one rabbit, one wolf, I think, and the one in the back, the black mask. I think it's another bird, but I'll probably just call it the black mask. The crazy thing is, we actually got to see both owls and the black mask in the very first video, which showed someone having an encounter with these creatures. Therefore, we may be able to assume that we were actually watching the violent encounter Daniel had three days after his dream. Though I do believe that Daniel, along with Margaret and Henry, are probably just children, considering they were asked to describe their dreams with crayon drawings. It would be kind of weird if a child was in the forest with a camcorder and had an encounter with the strangers alone, but who knows? In order to learn more about how these intuitane field dreams are going to affect the story overall, we'll have to move on to the next tape, Stranger Danger Puppet Show. If you couldn't already tell, this puppet show, Forest Friends, is the show that Margaret Pendleton described in her dream. The show was created by Luke and Dan, which is quite interesting, considering what we saw happen with them at the end of the Candlelight Service tape. We can probably assume that this takes place before that, then. The show begins with the yellow puppet Rex befriending the viewer and inviting them on a camping trip. He goes on to say that they'll even get to meet Ranger Luke, which we can assume refers to Luke Bale. Rex leaves and Anna, the pink puppet, enters and questions if the viewer is a stranger. Rex and Anna decide to go ask Ranger Luke, since he knows all about strangers. After arriving at the camping spot, Anna and Rex meet up with Luke, who looks at the viewer and says that the viewer doesn't look like a stranger to him. He asks the puppets if they remember how to spot a stranger, and since they say no, he breaks into a song about how to spot a stranger. Say. Do you guys remember the ways to spot a stranger? Well, um... Not really. That's alright. We'll learn together with our new friend. Yay! Yay! The song is about Little Red Riding Hood walking the trails to visit her grandmother. Briefly shown are two illustrations of a trailblaze and a suspicious hole in the ground, kind of like the one we saw in Daniel's drawing. Then, Red hears what sounds like birds whistling, but she doesn't see any birds, which means it's the masked people. She realizes she's on a false trail and turns around. Stranger, danger, when they are around, tell the park ranger, stranger, danger, don't trust the big bad wolf. Little Red arrived with her basket of bread. There was no sweet granny lying sick in her bed. It was too late, granny locked the door. Red saw her face, it wasn't her. Well, that was something. From here, Luke finishes the song with one last chorus. It might have been scary as hell, but at least it was a banger. We cut to see the two other puppets, Gleason and Oswald, wandering a trail in the woods. They were trying to follow a trail that led to the oldest tree in the woods, but since they weren't using a map, they accidentally stumbled across a false trail. This is when we begin to hear strangers whistling. It's okay. Do you hear the melody? That means the strangers aren't hunting. Well, as long as we stand still and be quiet, we'll be okay. So, if you didn't have the captions on, you would have missed a really crucial detail here. When we begin to hear the growling and the screen started to shake, the subtitles read, Strangers Harmonize and The Adversary Surfaces. Who the fuck is the adversary? Well, 
We're about to find out. We hard cut to a new section featuring a pig named Mr. Gungus. The goal is to play a game called Spot the Stranger, in which we see puppets with frightening resemblance to the masked people being used for this child-friendly demonstration. Finally, at the end it says, Can you spot the adversary? It writhes beneath the forest. A strange melody begins to play in the background during this section, which is when the captions tell us the adversary is lamenting. I'm pretty sure that the song playing in the background is a slowed version of the Stranger melody, just as a fun fact. Before we cut back to Mr. Gungus, a frame of video reads, The Burning Swords Protect Us. More on that later. Mr. Gungus thanks the viewer for playing his game, and we cut back to the campground after nightfall. This time, Luke is accompanied by all four of the puppets. Rex and Anna talk about how they went fishing, and Gleason and Oswald talk about how they went hiking. Then they share their encounter with the strangers with Luke and the others. We were trying to find the oldest tree in the forest, but we got lost. And before we even knew it, it was too late. We heard the strangers whistling. And what did you do? We stopped, stayed quiet. And when we couldn't hear the song anymore, we turned around. Great job, Gleason and Oswald. Now, what would you have done if it wasn't a song they were whistling? We would have closed our eyes and ran away. Great job! Hooray! To end the episode of Forest Friends, Ranger Luke says to always remember that strangers have no regard for your well-being and to never follow any of them into the woods, no matter how friendly, they might seem. Great! Then we get perhaps the most chilling revelation of the entire series. All of the puppets were named after four dead children from the Grandwood area. Ryan Rex Michaels, Samuel Gleason, Oswald Jones, and finally, Anna Carpenter. Presumably the sister of Daniel Carpenter from the previous tapes. Based on the information we just learned, we can pretty easily say that this program was likely Dan and Luke's attempt at a family-friendly approach to informing kids about the strangers after four local children fell victim to them. It really does seem like both Dan and Luke have been very well informed on the things happening in the Pine Barrens for an extended period of time. We've seen their names come up time and time again. A few neat details I want to quickly point out before we move on. In the opening scene inside the house, there's a framed picture of Anna Carpenter and an angel statue. Alright, now we've finally arrived at what is currently the final tape, Grandwood Park Ranger Training. This final tape is actually an employee training tape for new hires at Grandwood Park. It follows a man named Ranger Craig as we learn about the procedures that park rangers must follow to keep park guests and themselves safe and sound. Although the opening to this tape is very cheery and upbeat, that sense of security quickly fades, with the warning that soon follows. You may now choose to resign and leave the Grandwood Ranger program, or continue with your training. If you choose to resign, notify your training supervisor immediately. You cannot resign later. The contents of this tape are highly confidential. This is your final warning. Depicted above this block of text is a white stag with wings, accompanied by Latin text that translates to say, under the wing of an angel. From there, the video proceeds similarly to the first tape. The first section covers environmentally sensitive and unsafe areas. This section expands upon the idea of false trails that we've heard of previously. We then briefly get to see a stranger, and the narrator says that rangers should not hesitate to aggress anyone that refuses to leave the false trails. We also learn that the strangers will go as far as to make fake trailblazes, which rangers can cross-reference with their master map to then get rid of if necessary. Section 2 talks about tempting sights and sounds. As you might have guessed, this refers to the whistling sounds that the strangers make. We get to see an artistic depiction of them, along with a Latin name, which can directly translate to masked person, but the word personatus can also mean assumed, pretended, or counterfeited. 
The tape then expands upon the two different types of whistling patterns that we've heard so far. A distinct melodic pattern signifies a feeding gambit is underway. The generic melodic whistling signifies a feeding gambit, which possesses no immediate harm. As long as you stay on the correctly marked trails, this should be perfectly fine. The tape even says that investigating feeding gambits is not worth the risk. Section 3 refers to when safe areas become unsafe. This portion describes the rare case in which a hunting gambit occurs on normally safe sections of Grandwood that may be under your jurisdiction as a ranger. Hunting gambits are known for their more erratic whistling patterns, lacking any melodic coherence seen previously. This whistling is how they communicate. Refer to your handbook for more information regarding how to further decipher stranger whistling patterns. From here, rangers are expected to report the ongoing hunting gambit to the park headquarters, which will then cause an alarm to sound throughout the park, informing all other rangers to evacuate their areas. After a headcount takes place, any people unaccounted for must be searched for and all rangers will be dispatched to subdue the hunting gambit. Even after being dispatched, rangers are told that finding any of the missing people they're searching for is unlikely. This is because the strangers don't retreat unless they have enough sustenance, or if they've suffered many losses themselves. Since they hunt in groups, resisting or running away is generally futile. When you encounter a stranger, do not hesitate to aggress. Do not cease fire no matter how human their cries sound. They have surrendered their body to the forest, and you are doing them a service by freeing their soul. The narrator of the tape ends this section by telling ranger recruits that they should feel no guilt, no matter how human they sound. They're doing strangers a favor by freeing their souls from the forest. Congratulations! To end the tape, we see Rangers Dan, Luke, and Craig, Dan being the one that was narrating the whole time, all wave goodbye, and thus concludes Granwood Park Ranger training. Even though I think the puppet show tape is more well made just because of how ambitious it is, I think this might be my favorite episode of White Sag Education so far. They have a dedication to using almost entirely practical effects and costumes that I really heavily respect, and it honestly looks pretty good. Craig's acting in this tape also really shows the mortifying experience that dealing with strangers really is. I feel like White Sag is doing a lot right with just the right mix of horror and mystery to keep me hooked. I'm sure it'll get even better in the future, but for now, unfortunately, this is where the tapes end. Now we can move on to the analysis. So before we try to establish a timeline of events, I'm gonna need to talk about a few details that I've not mentioned yet. Alongside the videos being released on the White Sag channel are also various community posts sporting black and white photos captioned in Latin that tell stories of their own. The first of these translates to, the fiery sword was turned to stone. The image shows the two strangers donning owl masks. The second one, which teased the Stranger Danger puppet show episode, says, Margaret Pendleton's dream came true. The third post is a continuation of what was said in the first, the fiery sword is turned into stone, and the star of heaven is guilty. The image associated with this one is a cropped newspaper article describing the death of Luke Bale. A few details worth noting is that the headline claims he was murdered and that this did happen on Christmas morning, meaning Luke did actually die during the events of the second tape. The other side of the newspaper talks about recent sightings of the Jersey Devil, reported by the South Jersey Cryptid Society. Apparently, there was a large six-month gap in sightings until they were seen plentifully over the weeks leading up to Luke's death. 
Although the text is cut off, it seems to imply that the group was founded by Tim Grega in April of 1983, and this is the first time we have any sort of date to refer to in the entire series, aside from the fact that trailblazes were mandated in the late 60s. Finally, the most recent post, which teased the training tape episode, says, The white deer appreciates its companions. I believe that the fiery sword and star of heaven are metaphors for characters in our story, whilst doubling as references to the Bible. The Garden of Eden, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, is famously known to be protected by an angel with a flaming sword. The star of heaven being guilty could be referring to the adversary, which seemed to be responsible for Luke's death, who could be the flaming sword protecting the Pine Barrens. Or it could be referring to the comet that Henry Ledger foresaw. Who knows? For one final detail I stumbled across while getting close to finishing the script, I went onto After Ten's Instagram, and the descriptions of their posts all but solidify that there's demonic activity and the Jersey Devil and his subjects are at play. So yeah, that's nice to get out of the way. It's confirmed. The story is definitely dealing with the Jersey Devil. Now that we have the pieces, let's try to put together a timeline of events so we can see what's really going on here. Since the story is definitely running with the idea of the Jersey Devil, which I think is just the adversary, we can assume that whatever biblical lore is meant to happen came far before anything else we get to see in the series. We also know that the strangers have lived in the woods for a really, really long time. It also feels easy to place the Intuitane drug trials as the first events we actually get to see described seeing as it wasn't even produced by White Stag and had at least a seven-year history associated with it. At some point during the Intuitane trials, it finally made its way to store shelves in the form of a domestic pill, which had a notable side effect of allowing people to have vivid dreams acting as visions of the future. Daniel Carpenter dreamt of a violent encounter with the strangers, Margaret Pendleton saw a puppet show that had yet to exist, and Henry Ledger saw a premonition of a comet landing somewhere near his home. The other two events had eventually come to pass, but the comet, which was discovered thanks to the Intuitane drug, is still out there. Sometime before the puppet show would become a reality, four children would be either murdered or go missing, probably because of the strangers, and they would go on to be known as the Grandwood Four. Included in those four is what I believe to be Daniel's sister, Anna. The reason why I believe it to be his sister is because the illustrations in the Intuitane video seemed to all be kids' crayon drawings. The Grandwood Four would live on, represented by the puppets in Forest Friends, which seems to be a program to teach children about the strangers in the forest. This is where we learn about the adversary which writhes beneath the forest. I believe the large holes that we see have something to do with the stranger's method of sacrificing to the adversary. I believe the next event on the timeline is the recording of the ranger training tape. A minor detail I noticed that I hadn't pointed out yet is that we can see the camping ground used in the Forest Friends episode while Ranger Craig is searching for strangers. This is what leads me to believe that this takes place at least after the Stranger Danger episode of Forest Friends. The first tape is the hardest to place in the timeline since it lacks any meaningful overall narrative information and more or less acts as an introduction to the series. All we really know is that it had to have been made after 1968, since that's when trailblazes were mandated to be required on every trail, and it says that. But in reality, it was probably made somewhere in the 80s. There is one strange detail that could give us a little insight, though. In every other episode that includes them, Luke and Dan are both noticeably involved. I have two possible explanations for this. The first possibility is that Dan may have been a ranger for longer than Luke and simply made this tape before Luke showed up. The second possibility is that Dan made the tape after Luke's death. I honestly think both possibilities are equally plausible, just because of how little we really know. It's also interesting to note that this is the only episode that references the Ocean County Parks and Recreation as a relevant organization but I honestly don't think it means much. This leads us to another instance in which I can place the Christmas Eve candlelight service tape either before or after the first tape, but it's certainly the farthest we've gotten narratively. 
It takes place at least after 1983 since the newspaper detailing Luke's death talks of a cryptid society being founded in that year. But considering the wording used is 1983 and not last year or a few years ago, it's probably been a decent while. We can definitely assume from this information that this is taking place in the mid to late 1980s. From the sounds of the newspaper from the community post, it seems that Dan and Luke were pretty respected individuals in the local Grandwood community. Not only that, but if they were generally responsible for producing a local puppet show, it's no wonder that they'd be able to land the role of recording the candlelight service. I think they did this intentionally to gain access to the church's basement, which clearly had something in it. What was down there? Well, it could have been anything. We couldn't exactly see what was going on. The strangest part about this whole sequence is that there's a lot of information that's blatantly not being given to us. Luke seems to have been oblivious to what Dan was taking him down into the basement to see. They also seem to have a more complicated relationship than what we get to see from an outside perspective. The basement door is over there. I hate you so much. Be quiet. Holy shit! Be quiet. Dan also seemed pretty convinced that whatever he was looking at, he would be able to deal with it using only whatever weapon he had on him, which clearly was not the case. With an astounding amount of unknowns, this basement scene is definitely the most mysterious thing left within White Stag at this point in time. Arguably an even bigger mystery, though, is the one event left on our timeline that seems all but guaranteed to happen sometime in the future. The landing of Ledger's Comet in Barnegat Township, New Jersey. If this event is anywhere near as important as the other two that were predicted by Intuitane Fuel Divisions, then I'd say that it's gonna be pretty crazy once it actually happens in the series. And with that, our series timeline, as of now, is complete. Of the many obscure analog horror series that have been popping up over the past year or two, I think it goes without saying White Stag is definitely near the top of my list. I'll be keeping this one on my radar, and I think you all should as well. There's also many other neat, not as popular series like Arcadia and Milton Math games that I could definitely cover in the future as well. Let me know if you enjoy analog horror content and would like me to make more. Finally, of course, make sure to subscribe to the White Stag channel to support their project. If you had a good time, it would mean the world if you subscribed for more content like this and turned on post notifications so you never miss a video. If you want to support me further, $5 channel members get early access to new videos. You can also follow my socials and join the community Discord server. With all that being said, that's going to be all from me. I hope you enjoyed the video. Until next time.